Hello there, it's Pastor David Stewart of Destiny Preparation Church, welcoming you to our program, Road to Destiny, once again, but in a new year. It is 2016. Welcome to the first weekend of 2016, and we're happy to have you with us. Glad to see that you're still with us and that we're still with you. Hope you had a wonderful time for New Year's. If you weren't here celebrating with us, hopefully wherever you were, the Lord was with you and you had a blessed time. I hope you weren't losing too much out there. You know, you got to start the year the right way, the way you want the year to be. That's the way you want to start it. So hopefully you started it somewhere in the presence of the Lord. We're here in the house of the Lord at Grace Baptist Church, where we celebrate every week on Sundays and Wednesdays, getting ready for our Sunday morning service coming up in just a little bit. And uh, we'd like to invite you to come. All of our services take place here, and they take place again on Sundays and on Wednesdays predominantly. This month, a very special month, the beginning of uh, January, the beginning of the year, and oftentimes we do some special things. As This year we're going to be in special prayer and fasting throughout the month. You're cordially invited to join us. We'll be here again on Sundays with our Sunday school beginning at 10 a.m followed by our morning worship service here in the sanctuary at 11.30 a.m. And then on Wednesdays as well, we'll be meeting at 7 p.m. over in the classroom, special month of prayer and consecration. So join us for that. Also join us in prayer throughout this month. We'll be on, on our prayer line on Wednesdays at 6.30, just before service starts at 7. 6.30 p.m. on Wednesdays and 8 a.m. on Saturdays. You're invited to join us, call into this number and, and connect up with people who are calling him from throughout the country, particularly this month as we begin. As I was sharing, this is a time of beginning, new beginnings. January is always the beginning of the year. It's a time where we look back where we came from and where we begin to look at where we're going to go. Hopefully you're getting things in line, preparing for God's will to come into your home, to come into your job, to come into your life, to prepare for a great, great year in 2016. So I want to start you off with this sermon that's going to come to you it's from a little while ago, but it was the beginning of a year sermon called Making uh, My Plan. And God's plan. I pray it'll bless you to begin to get yourself in alignment with what God wants to do. Get your thoughts together in alignment with what God is speaking to you. And join us this month again as we pray, as we come together in fasting, as we seek the will and the purposes of God for our lives in 2016. Don't forget you can connect up with us anytime by checking us out either on our Facebook page or on YouTube. Or you can give us a call at area code 585-789-1DPC. We would love to hear from you connect with you, and get ready for 2016. God bless you. I hope that we will see you here in Destiny Preparation Church real soon. So once you begin to write down and document and clarify in your heart and mind your priorities for the year, then you need to begin to make a plan. How do I get to the achievements that I'm targeting? How am I going to get from here to there? I want to achieve this by the end of the year. How am I going to get there? I want to lose 50 pounds by year end. How do you get there? It's one thing to have a target. It's one thing to have a goal, but you need to have a plan. I want to read the Bible in a certain amount of time. Well, how are you going to get there? You need a plan on how you're going to do it. Okay? So you want to have a plan, not just ideas. Ideas don't get you anywhere. They sound great. They sound lovely. I'd really like to achieve this. I'd really like to climb that mountain. I'd really like to do this. But if you have no plan, those ideas aren't going very far. They may or may not happen. If you want to achieve something, you have to put a plan in place. And that plan needs to be achievable. Not just, you know, I want to read the Bible and I want it done by next week. Ooh, Lord. Okay, you got a plan to do that? That, that, that may or may not be achievable. I, I, I want to, you know, become my own boss, and I want to own my own business, and I want to do this by the end of January. Okay? That may be possible, but if you don't have a plan, it's probably not going to happen. It needs to be an achievable goal with a plan that can reasonably get you from stage one to stage two. And then you're going to have to be consistent in following the plan. You can't put a plan together today and you've lost it, forgotten all about it by next week. Amen? You can't put a plan together today and then change it six or seven times. Sometimes you may need to adjust it, but the goal, the end needs to remain the same and you need to stay consistent with your plan. 
My plan involves me doing a little bit less of this every day. Well, you got to stick to that. It involves me doing a little bit more of this every day. You got to stick to that. They're saying right now in terms of the gym, I saw somebody on television the other day talking about starting their new year out. You know, the gyms this time of year are just flooded. They're packed. They're jam-packed with people. And then, and everybody in the in the in the in the you know in the changing room, everybody was saying, "Y'all know by you know February first, we're gonna have our gym back, right? Everybody's gonna be gone, and we'll have our space back." You know, they say that to begin any behavior, change of behavior, that you need to be consistent with it for at least six weeks. They say if you're consistent for at least six weeks, you have a good probability that you will then establish and maintain that behavior after that. So you have to be consistent with the plan. If you just do it one week, you know, if you don't follow that up, it's probably not going to go any further than that. Now, along with these priorities and plans, you have to consider risks or limits of your plan. I'm trying to go very quickly, so bear with me. I can get the CD afterwards. Okay? You, you have to be aware of risks and limits because you cannot control everything. You think you got a plan, you think this will work, you think you've considered everything, but you know what? Stuff comes up that you hadn't planned for. There are things in your plan that may be a little bit more risky than other parts. I know I can do this, I can know I can do that, but I need this to work out here. If this works out, okay, then this will be, will be okay. But what happens in your plan if you get down the line to a certain point and something happens that you hadn't planned for? You have to have contingencies. You have to be ready to consider what happens if something goes wrong in your plan. You don't want to get to a certain point, oh, didn't work out, I quit. Right? Because understand, typically something is going to come up different from what you plan. So you have to be ready to deal with those things if something changes. Also understand that there are some things that are beyond you. Everything cannot be planned for. There are some things that happen, some things that are going to happen that are not in your control. So you're going to have to be ready to deal with that when it comes. When it comes to serving God, understand this. His plans can be different from our plans. You got a plan that you think is going to work out, but that plan may not be God's plan. And so it's important for us to align, to get synergy between what we're thinking is going to happen and believing for and what God is prepared to do. That's why in the month of January, we've got to stop and not only consider what we want, but consider what God wants. We've got to get the temple right first. And then we can follow the plan. Once we're in alignment with God, once we're on the same page, then we can follow his plan, uh, our plan, as, as, as though it's God's plan. Now, Jesus gave us one of the best examples that we can see of aligning our, a life plan with God's plan. Jesus lived for the purpose of the Father and understood that was his purpose. The reason Jesus was here, the only reason he was here, was to execute the will and the purpose of the Father. He had total understanding and he was totally comfortable with that. So whatever the Father wanted to do with him, that's what he was prepared to do. He lived out the purpose of the Father. And that purpose, number one, to show the world what it looked like to be God's man on earth, and then to save the world. That was his purpose. He lived for 33 and a half years to show the world. This is what it looks like to be a follower of God, to be obedient to God, to serve the Lord, to do what God would have to say. When you see my life, Jesus was saying, you see what we're, our lives are supposed to look like following God. And then to save the world. At a certain point in time, that phase of his, his objective was complete, and now he had to surrender his life to die to save us. That was his purpose. That's what he lived for. But even in the midst of that, Jesus in flesh had his own preferences. How many of y'all realize we have our own preferences? Even though we want to live for God, there's some things we'd rather do, and some things we'd rather not do. Amen? Some things we want out of life. Amen? I can imagine Jesus might have liked to have lived a little bit more than 33 and a half years. I imagine there are times when he probably wanted a break. Sometimes he went to the mountaintops because folks, let me just tell you, folks probably got on his nerves. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? There are times when he needed to retreat, to pray, to hear from God, to get re-energized. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of weight, physically, emotionally, and pouring out to people and helping this one and blessing and praying for that one and doing. There were times when he needed relief. There are times when he had his own agenda that he may have wanted to do, but yet he chose to surrender his Father's will. Let me ask you this. If you can't surrender your will in eating, 
What makes you think you're going to be able to surrender your will to the spiritual obstacles that come in your life? If you can't surrender up your preferences and choice in terms of what you do on a, in a certain day, how do we feel we can possibly submit to God when God's telling you to do things that you do not want to do? That's why we need to learn how to surrender and submit ourselves. Jesus just gave us the example of choosing to surrender and submit to his Father's will, even when it did not agree with his. In John chapter 14 and 10, Jesus says these words in New Living Translation. He says, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Jesus was perfectly aligned and determined to fulfill not his purpose, but God's purpose. That was his life. That was his reason for living. We ought to have this in mind, that the reason I live today is for God and not for me. The, prob the place we run into problems is when we forget that and we get so locked in on what we want that we forget to seek what God wants from us. How many of you realize, they tell, used to say in the old church, amen, that when, when we were saved, when Christ died for us, they used to say we were bought with a price. You've been bought. Your life is no longer your own. When you surrender to Christ, amen, you stop living for yourself and you start living for him. Just when he stopped living in order to save you, to give you life, that's when we stop living for us in place of that and then live his life instead. That's why we're called the body of Christ. We live for him, not for us. And so we have to make a choice every day to submit our desires, our preferences, our wants for God's wants. Amen? We make the choice. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 42, Jesus cried out. I told you he had his own preferences. He cried out just before, amen, they were come, the soldiers were coming to take him to the cross. He said, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Amen? How many of you realize Jesus was not exactly thrilled about hanging on a cross? He wasn't really excited. He wasn't praising God. They were about to beat him with stripes, and he knew everything was going to happen. They were about to put a crown, a crown of throne on, thorns on his head. They were about to beat him and smite him and, 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 and abuse him and lie on him, and his friends were about to walk away. How many of you realize this was not something that Jesus in the flesh was looking forward to? Amen? So understand, you may have to go through some things, amen, for God that you may not be looking forward to. Amen. That doesn't mean it's not God's will. See, a lot of us feel like, you know, oh, if this isn't going to be good, this can't be God. No, this can't. No, me going through this, God would never want me. Oh, yeah, there are times when you have to go through things that you may not be looking forward to, but it is God's will. And you need to go through it. Amen. I, I'm going to just put it out there today. I'm on one of those. Stop using those things as excuses. Amen. No, I'm not. I can't do that. It can't be God's will. God doesn't want me to suffer like that. Sometimes God chooses to allow us to suffer. And we have to be willing to submit ourselves to suffering for the name's sake of God. Amen. He said, if you be your will, Lord, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He would prefer not to suffer. But if God wants him to suffer, then I'm willing to to suffer for God's sake. That's the mindset we have to understand. You know, I may not want to do this. <laughs> I keep reeling. I may not want to fast this week, <laughs> this month, but Lord, if it's your will, then your will is more important than my satisfaction. Amen? Amen? Amen. That's a choice. That's a decision that we have to make. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father. The question for you today is, have you submitted your life plan to God? The things that you're thinking about doing, the things that you want to be, the things you want to achieve. Have you submitted your life plan to God? Have you put the temple first? Have you gotten your alignment with Christ as the first thing in your life before you started running off with our plan? See, that's why some of us run into problems. We run off with our plan of what we want to do, but some things are out, out of our control. And if God has a different plan than you, you got some trouble coming. Because God's going to do what he wants to do. So we need to align our plan to God's plan. I want you to understand that our self-nature typically considers us first 
and then others. It's our sinful nature. It's the self part of us that wants what we want first. We tend to priority that, prioritize that first, and then these other things kind of flow in and around that. Yeah, I want to make sure I'm okay, and then when I'm okay, then I'll help the needy kids, and I'll help this person over there, and I'll give more in the offering, and I'll do these different things, and I'll sacrifice my time. Once I'm set up, once I'm straight, once I get my house to where I've got the car and the stuff that I want, then I'll help somebody else. We, it's, 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 not, it's our nature to put self first. That's not a godly nature. That's a spirit. That's a sinful nature in us that wants us to be satisfied and have everything right first. And then we want to do what we want to do for others. In that, oftentimes we start running in a direction, find out we've gone the wrong way because we went on a track to do what we wanted to do to eventually find out, Lord, why isn't this working out? Why am I having so many problems? Why are there so many obstacles? What's going on? It's because we didn't stop to get ourselves in alignment with God first. You know, when two partners are working together, say you have a business, say you have a joint venture, and two, you, you're two partners, two partners can't each set up their plan for the year and then just begin to run off their plan, right? They have to sit together. They have to line up. They have to come into agreement. This is how we are going to work together. Husbands and wives can't just decide to do their own thing. I'm going to buy a car. I'm going to buy a house. Okay, well, whose money? How much money y'all got? Amen? You have to come together and come into agreement. These are our priorities. We'll take care of this situation, and then that one, and then in that one. The Bible says, how can two walk together unless they agree? We need to be in alignment with God. You can't have your plan and God's got his plan and then you're trying to figure out why things aren't working right. We have to come in alignment. God, here's what's on my heart. Let me understand and know that it's what you want me to do because if it's not what you want me to do, I don't want to run down that road, amen, just to hit a dead end. Let's get in alignment now. Speak to me, Lord, about what you want to achieve in my life in 2015. Show me where you were taking me. Let me get in alignment with your thoughts and your ideas, and then we'll make a plan that aligns with those things. Oftentimes, we need to understand, we need to question if our desires are God's desires. Are we in alignment? And what is it that God wants from our life in 2015? In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1, the New Living Translation, God is speaking here to the people, and he says this. Listen to these words. He says, destruction is certain for my rebellious children. Ooh, y'all didn't know God talked to his children like that, right? Destruction is certain for my rebellious children, says the Lord. Why? He says, listen, you make plans that are contrary to my will. You weave a web of plans that are not from my spirit, thus piling up your sins. God is frustrated with the children of Israel because they're going out doing their thing and they're not lining up with him. That's what happens when we decide what we're going to do and we're not in alignment with God. All we do is frustrate God and frustrate ourselves because we're trying to figure out why it won't work. God, why didn't this work? Probably because you didn't ask me first. Amen? What happens, I don't know about y'all, you ever have children, you know, that they make their own plans, decide what they're going to do? And either they, don't, they, they tell you later or they don't tell you at all. You're trying to figure out what's going on. You know, you want, if you were making a plan using my car, perhaps you should have told me about your plan because your plan might not work out, sweetie. Because I might have other plans for my car and for my house. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. God says he's frustrated with his children. They're running off making plans that don't align with him. We do the same thing to God. Come on. Amen. We decide what we're going to do and what we're going to be and where we're going without consulting God and then get frustrated wondering why it's not working. We need to be in alignment with God. Jeremiah 29 and 11, he says this. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God has plans in mind for you. We need to be in alignment with his plans. We need to align ourselves with what God is, wants to do in our life. And if you don't know what God's plans are for you, then you need to stop and ask him. You know how we do that? Prayer and fasting. Sounds familiar, amen? We learn what God wants by seeking 
after him. So before we get in gear and start running and towering into 2015, let me tell you, the first thing we need to do is stop and seek what God would have for us. We need to make God's plan our plan. Last thing I want to give you, if you want to experience success in 2015, let me give you five things real quick you need to do. Five things to do, amen, to experience God's success in 2015. Number one, determine your priorities. I've already given you parts of this. Determine your priorities. Seek God's priorities in your life. Make sure God is truly number one. As you start putting together and writing down and thinking out, these are the things that are important to me in 2015. These are the things I want to achieve. This is what I want to accomplish. As you start writing them down, then seek God. That's what we're doing in January. Make sure that God is in alignment with the same priorities that you are. You decide you want to go to the gym seven days a week. But, oh, gosh, being in gym all the time, I'm not going to have time to pray like I need to. Oh, well, I guess I'm going to the gym. Amen? You have to align your priorities to what God wants for your life. Well, God would rather have you pray. Okay? So I may have to go to the gym either less amount of time at a time or maybe less frequently because I got to get my prayer time in. I got to get my church time in. I got to get my feeding time in. I've got to get my priorities in alignment with God's priorities for me. Get the temple built first. Number one, determine your priorities. Number two, set targets. A lot of times we leave things so open-ended that we don't achieve anything. We kind of live life in this, we'll kind of see what happens mode. And as a result of that, oftentimes nothing happens. Nothing changes. We just keep going through things the same way and complaining about the same problems. Amen? I really don't like this. I really hate this. Well, why don't you do something about it? Hmm. <laughs> Novel thought, right? you got to set some targets. Okay, this is what I want to achieve. Be bold enough, have enough faith to stretch out on something. So many of us are afraid to believe for anything. I want a blessing. God's going to give me a new job. God's going to turn my home situation around. God's going to give me something that I need in my life spiritually. God's going to take me to another level. Set some targets in your life. Once you have those priorities, this is where I want it to, to take it to. By, by the end of the year or by the end of the month or midway through the year, whatever the case may be. You might want to set mini targets, milestones we call them. By the first quarter, by Mar end of March, I want to be here. I want to test that out because by June I want to be here. Number three, begin to make that plan step by step from the starting point to the end point. Make your plan systematically, okay, this is what I've got to do to get from here. I want to have $1,000 by the end of the year saved up. Okay, what do I need to do? I need the plan is I'm going to save X amount per week. You look at that plan in more detail. There's a couple weeks in here, I'm going to have some problems. i got other bills to pay. Okay, so I'm going to save a little bit more this week, and then I have to not save that week. Make a plan. Plan it out. You'd be amazed at how much money you can save in a year if you make a plan. If you have no plan, guess what? You probably will spend everything you take in. Amen? I won't ask for witnesses, but you will probably spend everything you have if you have no plan. If you have a plan, you'll be amazed. You've got to have a plan. That plan has to have priorities. Number four, write it down. I'm not talking about the plan in your head. <laughs> I'm not talking about you because we don't commit to those things. Write it down, document it, and keep it in front of you. The book of Habakkuk, chapter 2 and 2, says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain. What does he mean by plain? Clear and large upon tables that he may run that readeth it. What does that mean? It means make it so clear, make it so big, that somebody running past it will be able to see it and read it as they run. That's what it literally means. Big. Clear. You need to keep it in front of you all year long. Don't write a plan and stick it in a drawer. Leave it on your computer somewhere. You need to keep that plan visible. This is what I've committed to. You need to sign it. I'm, I'm committing to this. That's number five. Number five is make a commitment to the plan. Sign your plan. <laughs> I am locked in. This is not an if-maybe plan. I am committing $50 a week. I'm putting in savings every week. I'm signing on it. We're committed. Husbands and wife, come in agreement. You both sign it. You will both agree. Can't come back five weeks later saying, well, I don't know if I really meant that or not. Did you, really? Sure. No, no, no. You see there? You signed it. 
You signed it, I signed it, we're in agreement. Write it down, keep it in front of you. Keep your goals, keep your commitments in front of you. Put it on that refrigerator, put it on that wall, put it somewhere where you can see it every day and remember, this is what I'm committed to. I am going to pray. Some of you may want to have plans written down for the month of January. I am going to pray every day at this time. Sign it. I am going to spend time every Monday reading the word of God. I am going to, whatever it is, whatever is in your heart, let God speak to you and come with, into an agreement with your plan. I am going to be in church every Sunday in the month of January. I don't care what happens. Fire engine's coming, y'all take care of that. I'll see you when I get back. That, no, that's commitment. That's being committed. 